first of all, a uh, new housekeeping rule, which I hope everybody who cares about the Center for Universal Education uh, will abide by, which is the only excuse you have for not speaking on a panel uh, when you're asked is if you win the Nobel Prize <laughs> and the reception is that day. And on that, there's a huge amount of flexibility and generosity, but that's pretty much it. Uh, I have to say I uh, had a chance to meet with Malala and her father for 90 minutes, and uh, it's uh, the idea, talk about people who are too good to be true. They are too good to be true and uh, uh, in every way. Um, and it's just a, um, a huge, huge, her leadership is a huge boost, community leadership. Um, let me just make a few comments to frame this. Uh, uh, and it is so appropriate that we're doing something on community leadership when the source of the current youngest Nobel Prize winner ever was a girl, not even a young woman really, or barely a young woman, uh, playing such a powerful, brave leadership role in fighting for girls to go to school uh, everywhere in the world. So we couldn't uh, have had more appropriate timing. Now, one thing I just want to echo that Rebecca said, and uh, yes, uh, the best thing you can do as a founder is find uh, a new head who's way better than you ever were, and I've done that successfully uh, with Rebecca, who has expanded and done so many tremendous things here. Um, but I think one thing I want to echo that she said is that on these five uh, second generation goals, uh, these are really not second generation goals for the people who've worked on these issues. They've always been the goals. Uh, there was never, a, for the brave people who have fought for education in developing countries, the, the goal was never just to have girls have the same access to terrible schooling as boys might have. It was to have access to quality learning. It was never just to go to primary school. The Millennium Development Goal that says that we should have universal edu primary education is simultaneously the world's most ambitious and pathetic goal ever. Because you talk about little kids. I've had to speak to many little kids groups, and one of the first things they say is, why are you only aiming for primary education? And of course you're not. It is the necessary stepping stone. Center for Universal Education published in 2004, I co-authored with Barbara Herz, What Works in Girls' Education. If you look through the massive literature on what works in girls' education, the dirty secret there, or not so, dirty, or not, so, not so much of a secret, is the most impressive results usually are studies of young women, girls, who have had secondary education. So you have to look at the primary as the necessary stepping stone. So I think of the second generation goals as really the community of heroes up here basically screaming to the world, as Rebecca was suggesting, we're not even close to being done yet. And it's a reminder. So it's, a, it's, a remi it's not them discovering it. It's a reminding the world that the existing Millennium Development Goals were first steps. They were down payments. They're not, they're not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is girls empowered, charged, rising, uh, uh, having opportunity, uh, having uh, empowerment in their families, in their communities, in their governments, in ensuring that they are children and their girls will have the opportunities that perhaps they struggled uh, to have. I do think in looking at these second generation goals, the issue of safety has taken on a new meaning. There, there was always safety, but truthfully it was the safety of people worried about the long distances their daughters might walk. It was a more type of safety that many parents in a developed countries would worry about, just the safety of your child on the way to school. The occurrences of pe girls being targeted, even killed, because they want to go to school or kidnapped is really something that has taken on a new uh, 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 meaning and is new energy to empower them. Now, um, I uh, have had the ability to travel, and many of you have, uh, to, to see education developing countries. And I think many of us have gone through the following type of situation. You meet in the minister's office, and you see an excellent goal on, for example, 
education for prevention of AIDS. And then you go out and you see some schools in the community. And what do you see? Vast differences. You go to one place and there's books in the corner and there hasn't been any teaching. And then you go someplace else and there's an amazing program. And why? Because there are community leaders who are overcoming local specific obstacles to achieve a national goal. I uh, traveled with the head of FAWE, the, the um, Federation of, of African Women for Education. Uh, she took me to a school outside of Nairobi. Uh, and while we were there, the first thing they showed me was how the local community leaders had gotten several Maasai chiefs to sign an agreement over a period of a year or two to try to encourage their girls to not get early to marry early and to go to school. And while we were there, a grandmother and her 12-year-old were brought to the school. They had walked all night because her father was about to marry her off at 12 years old. And it was one of the chiefs who had su suggested to go to that school and to sit there and look at this little 12-year-old girl and think that if this if she wasn't being accepted by the school, if they hadn't walked all night, if there hadn't been community leaders overcoming, well, how can we say it? She would be being raped the next day, and her life would be severely set back. The power of that, which only happened because of the community leaders overcoming a very specific uh, 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 issues there, local, tribal, religious issues there that are different everywhere, was essential. So I think this fifth generation and the subject here so perfectly in honor, Malala, is perfectly timed, which is what, how do we create the community leadership and empower the community leadership that is overcoming the local, the specific barriers to achieving these worthy national and international goals? And that is an area where I think we uh, have underperformed, underspent time on, and why it is so excellent and appropriate that this is being considered one of the next generation issues and that we have this great panel. Um, I'm going to uh, briefly introduce the panel since you have it, and then I will sit down and start letting them uh, uh, talk of exactly about the situation. But we are uh, very happy to have Julia Gilliard, who was the former Prime Minister uh, of Australia, uh, what we used to call a head of state, um, and uh, more importantly, a distinguished fellow at the Center for Universal Education at Brookings. I hope the head of state stuff doesn't get totally, you know, back, you know, in the, I hope it still makes your Wikipedia page anyways. Um, and she is the chair of the board of the Global Partnership for Education, which is the number one global architecture for dealing with education. We're also very happy to have with us the, uh, His Excellency Li Tu uh, Bupao, who is the Vice Minister of Education Sports at the Lao PDR Ministry of Education. We appreciate you being here. Um, uh, also, uh, uh, Angeline uh, 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 Marima. Oh, God, did I just butcher that? Oh, that was just <laughs> terrible. And I wrote it out, too. Help me. Murimiro. Yeah, there you go. So beautiful. I won't even try to repeat it. Um, she is the regional director of CAMFED, which is really the campaign for education for girls. Uh, she is a founding member of CAMA, which was to get what she was, was one of the alumni that have gone through that are giving back. And boy, do you see this more often and why you should support girls' education. The degree of giving back, of paying it forward. Uh, uh, CAMFED is a group that I have uh, had the privilege of once helping to fund some support for, uh, uh, and they are an amazing uh, organization in Africa. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, Yervashi uh, Sani is a social entrepreneur focused on girls' education in India. Uh, she's been working on this for so long, has done so much good. Uh, she is exactly the type of community leader this whole conference is about. She is the founder of the Study Hall Education Foundation uh, uh, in, um, in, in India and uh, uh, is the very type of local hero who long before the world decided 
girls' education was a great global issue, she had decided it would be her life's passion. So we're really honored to have uh, everyone. And I'm going to sit down over near here, I think. And um, you know what? I'm not going to sit down because I'm going to put my up. Uh, Julia, question for you. Um, you are at the this is about community leadership, and yet you are at kind of the height of the global architecture. As you think about the global architecture for making sure the whole world is working together to hit the Millennium De Development Goals and these next stage goals, how do you, from this global architecture, or head of state level, ministry level, donor level, think about how you build into that infrastructure or those goals, the empowerment of community leaders, particularly community female leaders, to help implement that change? Well, that's a great question, and I think in many ways we're still searching for the best avenues to do that, which is why this panel discussion is so important, and also uh, the CHARGE initiative, which I've been involved with in my Brookings iteration, which met this morning, and Rebecca's shown so much leadership of, so uh, more than 30 groups coming together under the ambit of the Clinton Global Initiative for Girls' Education. Uh, from the point of view of uh, chairing the Global Partnership for Education, uh, we work globally and locally, and I think that is so important because it's genuinely a partnership model. It's a partnership around the global board of directors, so we have donors, developing country partners, civil society, the private sector, private philanthropy, but within country, within the developing countries that we work, and there's almost 60 of them, uh, what comes together is a local education group with all the stakeholders to try and work on an education sector plan to strengthen schooling throughout that country. And we've enjoyed a great deal of success at that, including on girls' enrolment rates. There's so much more to do. And we've set ourselves ambitious goals of increasing uh, completion rates of primary school and secondary school by 10% over the four-year period that we've been replenished for, uh, with the first year of that replenishment period starting next year. Uh, so it's a model at both levels. Uh, one of the things I think we always need to do is strengthen the intersection between our local education groups and local leaders, because the more grounded that can be in experiences within country, the better the answers that are going to be generated. And one thing we certainly know at the Global Partnership for Education is it's never a case of one size fits all. Uh, so it might be in East Timor, in my region of the world, uh, having a food program or an incentive program to get girls to school. Uh, in Afghanistan, where we also work, it might be about supporting the education of female teachers, because if you've got female teachers, uh, then families will let their daughters go to school. Um, in a country like Nigeria, it might be about strengthening a particular capacity for education in science or technology for girls. So we try to be very grounded in place and very responsive to what their vision of, uh, the local vision is of including boys and girls, city and rural, uh, with disabilities, universal, meaning universal in education. Thank you. And I think that's, I think, that's such an important point, what you said on the different strategies, because I think, I think we've all experienced that. Somebody gets very excited about a particular intervention, and then a group comes together and says, let's fund that everywhere. And then even though you find out uh, you know, having water close to a school is just a miraculous intervention in one place, you take it to another place and it's not needed as much. Um, and so these interventions that you put in a book and we talk about, uh, you know, you do find if you don't fo if you don't listen at the regional level, you can end up spending a lot of money and time on an intervention that doesn't make sense in the particular place that you've been. Le uh, Angeline, let me uh, um, first of all just use your first name as I've done so well. Um, and uh, uh, but secondly, um, you have been both uh, uh, a beneficiary of one of the. Uh, most successful uh, 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 initiatives that focuses on a local level. You're a beneficiary of it. You're now coming back as a leader of that. Uh, what do you see 
when you look, uh, uh, you know, when you look at CAMFED, what they do. Uh, tell us a little bit about explicitly how, in particular areas, you overcome whether it's the barriers of uh, culture, family, uh, lack of resources, uh, and what kind of lessons that shows, or how CAMFED is, deals with in wide areas, uh, uh, how you deal with those differences, and, and then what lessons you would also have for people here who might be dealing at uh, a donor level or a foundation level. Uh, thank you so much, Jean. Um, allow me to repeat what uh, Malala's father just said there. He said that I used to be, Malala used to be my daughter. Now I'm Malala's father. And I want to say the same thing about Comfort. Uh, and you've rightly said it. There was a time when I benefited from Comfort's agenda of girls' education. Now I'm setting the agenda for how Comfort can assist thousands of girls and millions of girls in, in Africa. Uh, talking about my own life story, I was born in a very poor family in Zimbabwe, uh, a very rural family. Uh, my mother knew how important education was. Uh, she didn't need anybody to come and sensitize her on why it's important. That much she knew very well. And um, it was unfortunate that most people confused her lack of means with her lack of understanding the value for education. And I want to be able to say uh, what was most helpful in the way that Comfort assisted me and assisted the millions of other girls from my community and across Africa is that uh, understanding that there is an underlying commitment to education in those communities. And the way that support is provided allows for young women to be able to come through that system and want to be able to make a difference. The education doesn't alienate you from your community. It allows you to become a celebration point for the community. And then you start shining. What lessons have I learned from that whole process? It's understanding what exactly poverty is and how it's often misunderstood. What happens at the very local level, which is critical for us as global leaders to be able to understand, is that poverty manifests itself in multiple different ways. And some of it are very hidden for outsiders. And oftentimes, my mother was accused of not understanding why it was very important to support this bright girl uh, to go to school. I'll give you just one very quick example. I recall one day when I was told to go and tell my mother to come and be addressed by the school head on why she needed to pay my school fees because I was one of the students who was guaranteed to pass. I didn't go and tell her because every single night I, I could hear my mother crying because she didn't have the resources she needed to keep me in school. So to go and tell her what I knew that she already knew, to go and tell her somebody should come and tell her that, for me, I wasn't going to allow that to happen to my mother. I will not tell you what else happened to her and how she was misunderstood by that. But I want to be able to say that there is a role that girls and young women, we have succeeded against all odds in very difficult contexts. Girls like Malala, girls that have lived in strict situations that still have mattered. There's a role that we, we can play in girls' education. It is the most sensible thing to use, to work with, to allow them to lead these uh, second generation issues. I like uh, your example, um, Rebecca, when you said to finish the rest. It's, it's about using this new human and knowledge capital that we didn't have when this whole global discussion around girls' education started. It's about using that experience, that expertise, that subtle understanding of what happens within communities and beyond. And not just looking and boxing it as just but a community initiative. But if there are 10 communities that are doing the same thing, 100 communities that are doing the same thing, 1,000 communities, that becomes a movement for girls' education. So we need to be able to look at this as it is the multiple collection of local initiatives that become the movement for girls' education. If you're going to go to scale, if you're going to sustain this, if you're going to have real advanced change beyond access to quality, to relevance, to sustenance, it's not just about giving back. Make sure that the current education system 
is such that girls and young women's voices, stories, experience shape the dialogue and the intervention. What would you say is the, if you had to pick one barrier that you face, is it in the case of your family, it seemed more just the, the absurdity of having, of poverty in the face of having to pay school fees. Is what you're dealing with at that local level, is it, is it issues that really you have to deal with national local policy on? Are there local things you're doing? What, give example of where CAMFED helps overcome uh, what would be, a, resi what would be uh, a blockage, whether that's something in the community or national policy, failures of national policy. The beauty of the comfort program is, and how comfort works, is that we look at not one specific problem, but we engage with communities on what is it that you can do to get your children in school. Is that the nature of the dialogue, the way it is framed, that makes the difference. It is not coming into a community and saying, you need school fees, no. It's about, okay, what is your vision for your girls? What do you want for your daughters? And oftentimes, you discover they want their children to be doctors, they want them to be nurses, they want them to be engineers. And then you say, uh, where are they at now? Uh, well, most of them are not completing school and, and all that. And what can you do now with what you have, with what you know, to be able to make this transformation? As a principle, comfort never does for a community, what they can do for themselves. And it's never about coming in and rescuing the community. It's never about heroism. It's about coming into the community and partnering with the community to address what is most important to them. So yes, poverty is always at the center, but poverty manifests itself in multiple ways. The poverty in the family scenario, at times communities can get defensive and say, I don't know, I don't send my daughter to school. Because how can I tell a stranger that as a father or as a mother, I'm failing to provide for my children? Because if it's culture, why is it that when somebody comes in and say, I, I could pay the school fees, or I could provide the decent clothing, or I could provide a school close by, why is it that they allow their girls to go to school? So it, it's about digging beyond the superficial presentation of ignorance or of no interest in education to be able to dig deeper. So I want to be able to say that usually the barrier, if you ask me, is at times a lack of understanding at global level of what exactly is going on. Because at times what it appears to be is really not what it is. Gotcha. Well, let me uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Ravashi, you have uh, been engaged for 30 years, and I guess it might be good for you to tell us just a little bit about what, your, uh, what you've done what your, your program has done, but also what you see as this same role of community leaders and the leadership factor uh, in helping to uh, achieve uh, you know, many of the remarkable results where so many of their children outperform uh, 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 their peers, uh, even though they're from more difficult circumstances. Tell us a little bit about your specifics, in particular in this context of this conference on the role of community leadership. Uh, thank you, Jean, and thank you, everyone, and thank you, Angeline, for the good lead. Um, uh, I just want to talk about the second generation goes a little and take the lead in, and I really like them, and I agree with you, Jean, that a lot of us have been working at them because we believed in doing the full job. And I want to uh, point out the quality learning and the completion of a secondary school, for example. And I'll just use myself as an example that uh, I, my parents came from Pakistan. They had to flee during partition. And my father came from a very patriarchal, strong patriarchal mindset that believed that girls were meant for domestic, sexual, and reproductive labor, and that was their goal. And, but we were poor when we started, and he went on to become a middle-class person. And so he sent me to, as a status, to a very good school. It was one of the best private schools. It was cheap, but it was good. And I performed really well. I finished my secondary school education, and I topped my class. And then next year, I was married at 17. Right. So this was supposed to be quality learning. It was supposed to be completion. It was completion of secondary school. And yet, I did. I was married off. 
And so what that brings me to the point that we need to define quality learning well, that what do we mean by quality learning? Does it only mean reading, writing, and learning academics? And secondly, does completion of secondary complete the job too, right? Which is why the fourth generation is really important. What my education didn't do was, it didn't teach me that I was an equal person, that I had the right to use my education for myself. It didn't build any aspirations in me. So that when that happened to me, I couldn't resist. It didn't build any resistance in me. It didn't empower me, right? So what we've done since then, um, when I found education to be really important, and it was when I understood that I was an equal person, when I understood that I had the right to do something with my life and to aspire beyond, is when I really learned to do what I could, and which is why I'm here. With our school, we started with that, understanding that that access is not enough, of course, and even quality learning means that you look at the conditions in which the girls live their lives. They come from really very poor households where domestic violence, child marriage is rampant. Right? And so we said that what they needed to do as part of their career, we made it our educational goal, looking at life outcomes and not just at learning outcomes, to see that they, were, they would not leave that school till they understood that they were equal people, persons, deserving of respect and autonomy, that they didn't leave without aspirations to do something with their life, to beat their challenges, that they didn't leave till they were strong enough to resist all the discrimination that they faced at home. Right. We've talked about safety in schools. In countries like India, look at the high rates of domestic violence, look at the high rates of incestuous sex violence. So where's the safety at home? So unless they're strong enough, it's not enough just to guarantee safety in schools. We would talk, we use critical feminist pedagogy, and we would talk about the patriarchal structure and their place in it. We would talk about child marriage and what, how they faced it and how it happened in their communities. We would talk about domestic violence. We would talk about what they wanted to be, and systematically we would build aspirations in these girls. And as a result of which, our completion rates are 88%. And our girls outperform all national averages. And out of those 88, by the way, we have a 98% transition to higher education. And many of our girls go on to master's education and then an MBA too. And most importantly, they work with their own communities then to lead the charge against domestic violence, against child marriage. So the goal here was to build teachers as leader in a leadership role and young girls to help, help them understand that they must expand their role to think, becoming advocates for girls' rights, teaching girls how to be self-advocates, and then using their position and their association with the community to advocate for girls' rights to the parents, helping them value their girls, and to, get, and to be on the girls' side as they advocated for themselves. Since then, we've expanded our program to 100 schools so that we're reaching out to 10,000 girls and 10,000 families. And our students have led last, large campaigns in their community against child marriage just recently in February, and there were 14,000 of them that were engaged. We believe that when we talk about local leadership, that really as educators, I found it really very useful to, to develop teachers as local leaders. They're very well positioned to do that. And in turn, they develop girls as local leaders. And together, they work with the community to help them see girls as equal, autonomous persons deserving of respect. Thank you. So 88% graduated from, from secondary school? Yes, class 12. So uh, that's, that's better than United States average, for what it's worth. 98% uh, going to college way, or any kind of higher education is uh, uh, significantly better. Um, so thank you. That is, that is uh, uh, very thought-provoking. I'm sure we'll have lots of questions. Uh, Minister, you and I have something in common. We've had to sit around making national policy, and then you have to wonder, as you do it, whether it's going to actually happen. Uh, whether the good goals and good policies will actually be implemented in the way that you uh, envision. Um, how do you, listening to uh, you know, the, the, the two who, who just have spoken, how, how do you, as you're doing this, uh, think about how you combine your strategy for a national policy, your national goals for girls' education, with the kind of uh, uh, community 
uh, uh, leadership uh, uh, or dealing with the you know local uh, or more unique issues in making sure those happens it must be a, an enormous challenge and I think we'd be interested to see how you look at both from national perspective understanding that much of the implementation and success is going to be dependent on the amazing people uh, like we've just heard from. Thank you. With regard to Lao PDA context, uh, we consider that committee leadership is very fundamental to ensure the sustainability of socioeconomic development, and particularly in education development. In our context, uh, I want to inform you that in 1975, the year we established Lao PDA across the country, more than 90% of our Lao citizens were still illiterate. How to ensure everyone have access to quality education, particularly girls? Because uh, we have well know that uh, in the former regime, they do not pay attention to general education. So now, we highly appreciate that how to ensure that every citizen have the right to contribute to socio-equitable we have established to ensure education payment, to ensure the leadership of local authority. The law government established a tribune, we call it tribune. What we consider we call uh, province as uh, strategic unit. District should be a strong, comprehensive department unit. And village as department unit. So to ensure that for education sector, we have established what we call Village Education Department Committee in charge of particularly education payment. Where to build school, how to build school, what we have school, how to mobilize every child to go to school to ensure that no exception, boy and girl go to school. And within the Village Education Committee, we have women union president as the leader to mobilize mother to send your, child, your uh, girl to go to school. Because culturally, traditionally, in the remote area, isolated area, disadvantaged area, and particularly ethnic area, mostly they want to keep their daughter with them to work in the farm. And they send their boy to go to school. Gender issue. So, we have to mobilize, to sensitize the village education open committee. They have a meeting every month to have a, a discussion which family do not pay attention to their children to go to school. And they know which family, which problem you have, how the village committee can help you to sell your children to go to school. So we consider that. Le uh, community leadership is very, very fundamental for us. Uh, and now we are moving in the process uh, and we have a lot of progress. In the past, where we do not have this kind of organization, many villages, the net enumerate in primary school nourish more than 50%. But now we reach already 98% across the country due to this uh, establishment of village education the committee. And we will strengthen. Quali quantitatively, we may say that now it's okay. But our big concern is the quality. It's a big concern. We have to strengthen, to improve quality education in the remote area, isolated area, and disadvantaged area, particularly for ethnic group area. Lapia has more than 94, uh, uh, 49 ethnic group. So each group have this old uh, dialect, this culture, is belief, that is concerned. Why to overcome that? So community leadership is very fundamental and crucial for us, and we continue to strengthen that to make sure that everywhere the community should be the ownership and leadership for socioeconomic in general, in particular for education permanent. That's okay. uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, um, well, let me, uh, uh, because we have a pretty important guest coming after this, uh, it's a pretty good example of uh, uh, le uh, uh, local and national leadership coming. Uh, we will, uh, let me try to go and start and see who has questions for uh, uh, any of the panelists. Um, 
anybody, uh, if not, I am happy to fire questions myself, but <clears throat> who would like to, anybody like to start off? I've never seen a group this, this shy. So let me, um, uh, let me ask, um, Rashi, I, let me try to let me make sure I understand. I think what's what's very important you're saying is that you're actually trying to ensure that in the education you are building in the women's empowerment as an actual form of curriculum that is part, and that in able to do that at a mass level, you really have to essentially teach the teachers or have the teachers take the leadership role so that you can be be doing that, and and uh, uh, and I guess the question is, does that uh, uh, that that must seem to also inspire a desire for higher educational achievement? Based on what you've said, do you want to say a little more? And then I'd be also interested in what is the degree on the curriculum side uh, uh, for CAMFET? How do, how do you look at those type of issues too? Is that through the classroom, through the community, in terms of the kind of leadership? Uh, capacity. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that question, Jean. Uh, actually, what we want to do going forward is, of course, we include gender studies, and that's what I'd like to call it, not just girls empowerment, as part of the curriculum. But going forward, we're advocating with the government to include gender studies for both boys and girls as part of the official curriculum. Because think of it that if all our students need to know math and they need to know science, because they need to think scientifically and mathematically. Why do they not need to think equitably? Especially in a country, where, and countries like ours, where gender is a life and death issue. Girls are dying, right? There are, all, there are two rapes every hour, right? A one million girls killed in the womb, right? And girls and having the lowest rate of survival age one to five compared to boys. So why do they not need, and why do boys not to think about, uh, need to think about it as well? So of course, as we are advocating for the inclusion of gender studies, and maybe you can help me think of a better name that is more, receives a more hospitable <laughs> hearing. Uh, and what it basically means that he'll understand that as a citizen, your constitution guarantees you all these rights. In a democratic constitution, a patriarchal structure has no moral justification whatsoever. Right. So let's look at the social structure, let's look at patriarchy, let's look at how power plays itself out in, this, in our society. And let's look at it both, boys, girls, let's all of us look at, look at it and see how we can make it better. A critical pedagogy is what is required, right? So what we're advocating is that, yes, let's get everybody together, local leaders, academia, policy makers, let's think and come up with a really strong gender studies curriculum or call it citizenship, something. And, uh, and also then a very strong teacher training program where teachers learn to think about gender, men and women both, and then they learn how to play the advocacy role with communities, how they teach and how boys, how they train boys to become advocates for girls as well, girls to become self-advocates, and finally community, fathers and mothers to become advocates for equality. I asked one of my students actually, I said, you know, Sunita, do you think we should have more prayer nads? Prayer is the name of our school means inspiration. She says, you know, the world would become a different place. And I said, yay. But the point is that that's what you need. If educators are so powerful in what they can do, right? And we're not using it because we define quality so in such a limited manner. It's not just about reading, writing, math, and science. It's really about citizenship education. It's about teaching equality. Why don't we need to teach equality? Freedom, peace, liberty, you know? Well, I will say that... Um, <laughs> Uh, again, in terms of the gender studies or whatever being for both, you don't have to be reading the papers much in the United States about the sexual violence in our college okay. campuses to understand your point that it has to be for the men, boys, and the girls. And for those who haven't seen the beautiful documentary, Girls Rising, I mean, one of the most just heart-melting places in there is the big brother yeah. who comes and saves his sister from uh, an early marriage and difficulty and, 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 the, and just a very visceral reminder of the role that a boy, a family member looks at when he 
you know, has a different vision of what's possible. Um, do you want to add? Yeah, talking about uh, broadening the curriculum or actually teaching <laughs> girls and young women what they really want to learn and what would make the most difference in their life. I, I would take you, you know, a big bet, you know, a bit back in talking to you about uh, Comfort Association, which is the Young Women uh, Network, started by the first group of girls, me included, who were supported through School by Comfort in 1998. We started with 400 of us at that time. Uh, as I speak right now, we're over 24,400 across Africa. And um, what we did over the last few years was to look at what is it that we would have wanted to learn when we were at school? What would have made the most difference? Yes, I think some of you would want to call them, some of them 21st century skills. And where comfort, I want to be able to talk about where how local leadership can also partner with international NGOs. Where comfort, the organization came in, was yes, with support with the resources, but also with linkages to partners who were experts in curriculum development, but not on the content, not on what was going to be covered that the people who contributed what was supposed to be taught, what we wanted to be taught in school, was actually the young women's network that had gone through school. We went out as well in communities and in schools and consulted with students, consulted with teachers, and consulted with community members to say what would you have wanted to learn when you were at school. Because what we're doing, we're designing a life skills curriculum which was going to be administered by the constituency of young women as social activists for education. And the things that came out were critical thinking skills. The issues that came out were resilience, were issues around empathy, technology, uh, financial literacy training, entrepreneurship. Yes, there was agreement that academic learning and learning literacy and numeracy is critical for foundational skills. But as you go into secondary schools, you want to be able to be prepared for life after school and life as an adult. So when we start talking about the broader learning outcomes, talking about the curriculum, yes, we have actually designed one as young women supported through school, as young women who are now activists and in, in girls' education, and working with our communities to be able to say, how do we cover the other areas that are not being covered in the school system? And it's not about creating a parallel system. It's about creating a complementing element. And you know, various ministry officials were involved in that. But also besides that initiative, which was very directly linked and you know, run and you know, developed by Kama. Kama members sit on multiple forums in you know, the national countries that we work in. And one of them, I'll give an example of in Zimbabwe, where I'm a member of the Teacher Professional Standards uh, setting you know, group and funded by GPE. And one of the things that we made sure was included within the professional standards of a teacher was issues around teachers need to be trained on issues around dealing with psychosocial issues, on dealing with the 21st century <coughs> challenges that were coming in. So just to say that it's not just about local small group gatherings, it's about how you can influence government. But also Kama members are members of the Learning Metrics Task Force. We've come on members that are also, you know, like part of the, you know, Secretary General's Youth Advisory Council. There are come on members who have participated in President Obama, you know, Young African Leadership Initiative. And these are not, you know, small one, two, three, four girls. It's a whole movement for girls' education talking about what is it that should be taught and what difference you did make and who should be shaping it. Excellent. Madam Prime Minister, uh, from either that, the role, your current role, or uh, in your former role, do you have thoughts on follow-up thoughts on the issues of the either curriculum design or the kind of leadership training specifically um, that you'd like to draw on? Well, I, I think it's been a fantastic insight into something that isn't often apparent from the global level about the curriculum needs, curriculum demands and the real changes that can be brought in people's lives if we broaden our horizons. I mean, inevitably, much of the global debate is around the things we can measure, and we can measure numeracy and literacy, and we do need to measure them because uh, we know that the quality of so much of what is happening in schools is not good enough to give kids those foundational skills. So we can't let up on that, but I think we do have to listen to uh, you know, the voices and localised voices that are saying that there is a need for the broader curriculum, particularly at the secondary level. Uh, so I think one of the challenges for all of us is 
if, as we expect, when the Sustainable Development Goals replace the Millennium Development Goals, that the world lifts ambition from uh, universal access to primary school education to at least universal access to lower secondary education, what will that mean uh, within countries for what will be taught to those children that then access lower secondary and particularly to those girls? Uh, from the point of view of GPE, our model isn't to sit at the top and mandate. That's not what we do. But I think we've got to be very sensitive to these voices coming up locally about what people need and want and would be more empowering and fulfilling for them from their education. And one of the great things about the CAMFED model uh, is that it's channeling those voices continuously. It's a sort of replenishing supply uh, because the CAMFED alumni then go on to help the next generation of CAMFED girls. And the work you're doing, obviously, is bringing people, uh, women and girls, along so that what you're doing is sustainable as well. Uh, so that long-term sustainability is so important too. Minister, you, you've just gone through how great your challenge and how great even the diversity is within your country. How, when you're at the ministry, do you think about the issues of curriculum or not non-traditional curriculum in helping to overcome these barriers to getting more girls a quality education? Uh, for Apidia, curriculum is very important. How to ensure gender issue? particularly as grass, at the grassroots level. If not, uh, how you, we can uh, mobilize girls to go to school. So we started to uh, capacity building, particularly we start to train female teacher from different ethnic group, different uh, area. Because in the rural area, as we all know very well that contrarily, our former country, uh, uh, the family promote boy, more than girls, as I mentioned. So, okay, a big uh, support from Australian government, we call it LABEP, LABEP project. We focusing on training female teacher first. Uh, and in everywhere, we should look at our curriculum. Is the curriculum is related to the real context, the social equipment in different areas, the culture and so, to make sure that the curriculum respond to community level. And based on that, our female teacher, they know how to encourage children to go to school, how to keep uh, children in the school to complete primary level. That is very, very fundamental and useful for us. Very, very good. Thank you. Um, any, uh, do we have, t I think we have time for a question or two? Yes. Okay, it's quality education. And um, I think as Angeline was saying, every African mother who wakes up every morning, and I believe Asian and others, see the only hope for their children as being quality education, getting somewhere, not just getting, getting to school, which seems to have been an obsession for all these years, and maybe understandably so. But now children are going to school, they are not learning, and we know that. And I am very impressed by the very high number of children that are 88 percent, and then 99 uh, going to to higher, you know, to, 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 to tertiary education of one form or another. Could you just tell us how that is done? Because I think from a community level, that is the one of the reasons, the main reason why people in the mother would be crying at night, wondering where is the child going to get. And yet we are really not delivering on that promise. And this is. At least global south, that is that is a problem. If you could just tell us what you have done to get these high rates, and also who who are the main players, because a part of this is technical. It is not just uh, just the talking. It is really getting the curriculum to really face issues. So we'd appreciate hearing what you are doing and how we turn people from obsession about access to real change that will transform the girls' life and get them involved in economic development. Thank you. In fact, all these girls, many of them are engaged in child labor, so that they work in the morning. A typical girl's life would be that she would go get up at 6, go to work, come back, 
go to school, come back, go to work, and then when there's no electricity, you don't know how she'll do her homework. And then there's 88%, right? The school is four hours. One, of course, the teachers are trained to think of girls' limitations at home and to make sure that whatever they deliver, they deliver in school, right? And secondly, all very strong time on task, very strong teacher attendance, and thirdly, very strong tracking of girls' attendance. If they are not coming, why aren't they coming? Are they being married off? What's the matter? And very strong community relationship, very strong peer support, and a strong universe of care in school. Then building aspirations in girls, which let me tell you, 75% of the job done. When they feel that they really want to succeed, they're able to beat all the challenges at home. Because a lot of the challenges are at home in India. It's not that every mother there is waking up in the morning thinking, I want my daughter. She's saying, hey, listen, stay at home. I have six kids at home, and you'll help me at home. Right? Never mind school. And one of them told me, she said, I have to cook. So whenever I have a test, I've learned how to hide my book like this and cook. And so it got a little burnt, you know. So do you mind? I said, well. And so they would come and say that I couldn't study at night. Can I have a little more time to study? And the teacher says, OK, I'll give you one hour. Go back, do this, and then you have a test. Right? So it's a combination of many things. But if I were to think of some key points, one is truly the caring that the teachers believe they can do it and the girls begin to believe they can. A very strong relationship with the teacher, building of the aspirations, and teaching them how this is going to change their lives. The empowerment curriculum, where they learn to think of their challenges and are able to strategize together on how to beat them. That is really important, too. So I think it's a combination of things. But most importantly, schools need to become centers of care. Caring is really, really important. Care, and they need to become believers in girls' lives, that lives can become better. Right? And so that, that talks to teacher training in a very, so when we talk about quality learning, I think we need to deepen and widen the meaning. That's important. When you talk about teacher training, you need to deepen and widen the meaning of teacher training and what it means. So um, I am so sorry. We now, uh, I, we need to end, yes? yes. We need to end. Uh, so we can uh, make room um, uh, for our uh, distinguished guest. Let me just very quickly say I thought this was, you know, just a terrific panel, and and the both the diversity of perspectives and yet very similar uh, uh, and important points. And I think for the, the the prime minister, the now chair of the global partnership, the view that you have these, these fundamental goals, but the ways to reach them are going to be very localized and how you build uh, that into your uh, assumptions uh, or not to have assumptions of the same policies working everywhere and how at that global architecture level to build that in. I think uh, what you heard from the minister is a very important issue, which is the degree that parents who love their kids very much are in extreme poverty and the desire to, the need to have them deal with that extreme poverty, which is so immediate, can make it very difficult and that you need the local leadership to help make the case for going to school and that you have to have, uh, and we've heard on teacher training, and in this case the idea of having female teachers, the importance of them trained, but also from the right different ethnic groups in a country who will understand and able to, to deal with those uh, issues. I thought, you know, all very, uh, uh, very interesting um, and important points. Though I think that uh, while that is the case, I think it's also important to hear Angeline's side as well, which is that in many places that ethic may be there with the with, with the mothers and the families. And I think one thing I think you hear from all smart NGOs is go into a community, not with the answer, but with the question. What's your vision? How do you do it? That's where you learn the most. That's where you help the vision. And I think, uh, uh, and then the importance of having an ongoing network, of building a network that is not only for the training, but the empowerment for the advocacy. And then I think finally, uh, uh, as Ishwan, uh, Ashwani uh, was um, uh, going through very interesting on the importance of us not just thinking of curriculum as math and science, as the Prime Minister said, in terms of just what the metrics, but the most important things in motivation, in life outcomes, uh, maybe this, uh, 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 this gender 
uh, education that it needs to be for boys and girls, and that you aren't going to really have that widespread unless the teachers are capable. Uh, these are all very specific things. You know, when we talked as a panel, I said, this is an educated group. People know the generalities of the goals, uh, but this was just what we hoped for, which was from you know, four or more different countries, very detailed, specific, contextual views uh, that many of us would not get just uh, sitting around reading briefs. And uh, it's extremely helpful. We're extremely uh, grateful and, and just ask for applause for this great panel. Now, having had to work for two presidents, I am often the one who doesn't have to deal with any of the problems of, you know, motorcade, of like having to wait in traffic for motorcades or having to sit in your seat because there's security issues and you have to just sit in your seat. But now I'm just a private citizen. Uh, so like all of you, we have to just stay seated right now, not leave the room, uh, uh, and uh, so that we can have, uh, get the setup for our next speaker. Um, uh, the First Lady, and I think that there's, uh, uh, Strobe will come introduce her, but I think that, you know, one thing that just really struck me, which I'm sure she will discuss, is just the personal passion that she brings into this as a daughter who has risen to such amazing academic and professional heights as a dedicated mother, but about just what we as people would ask want for our children and the universality of that. So I just want to say it is such an amazing thing to have uh, a first lady so dedicated and so willing to come on this particular issue, which is where her passion is, and come speak. So with that, I Welcome. will turn over. <laughs>